This is Nursing Uncensored. I'm your host, Adrienne Benning, and I invite you to listen in on conversations I've had with real nurses about the crazy and wonderful lives we lead. This podcast is meant to create laughter in addition to serious discussion, and nothing is off limits. We're always honest, but we're not always safe for work. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Nursing Uncensored. I am here today with a great episode for you. We are going to be talking with Janine Kelbach. Yeah, and you are with the Savvy Scribe podcast. Really, you've got like a Savvy Scribe universe over here. And uh, we're going to talk for a little while today, but I would love it if you would just tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do, because you do a lot of really cool stuff. Sure, sure. Thank you for having me on the podcast first off. And yes, I am a registered nurse like many of you. And I work still labor and delivery at the bedside on my weekends. And I'm the OB educator during the week at part time. And I took on writing back in 2013 and officially started my business in 2015. My actual LLC is WriteRN. And I actually have a website for that too, WriteRN.net. And in 2019, I started the Savvy Scribe podcast in order to get the word out for nurses to become writers if they wanted to. And you don't you know, have to jump into it full time or anything like that. It's a nice side gig. And with that, I've grown a community and people to take courses. And we really have just a great network of people and everybody's doing their own kind of writing thing. So you you do it all, and you're a mom on top. And of I'm it. a mom <laughs> and a wife, <laughs> and that's and and those are full time jobs just yes. by themselves. So this is great, and actually, um, I've been a fan of your podcast for a while. I'm like a bloodhound when it comes to podcasts, and so with any kind of nursing podcast, I mean, my podcast subscription list is ridiculous. And some shows I listen to a few times, and then maybe I'm not drawn back. But yours, like you have episodes throughout. You've got what, like 50 episodes or something? 45? Yeah, episodes? this week will be my 50th. Yeah, so I, I'm paying attention. I see you. Thank you. <laughs> but yes, but I'm excited because um, you have several different types of episodes that I love that I listen to. Um, and then in addition, you've got, you know, we'll talk more about like your coaching services and your book. You wrote a book? Yes. Yes, all, in all my free time, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just a hobby, just like a little side gig. Yeah. Um, but your book is called, I, I know I'm not going to be able to say it right. Will you please say the title of your Sure. Book? Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs. <laughs> like a little subtitle is 30 plus nurses turn into business owners and share their secrets to success. And yeah, writing who, is one of them, you know. Who doesn't Podcasting's want that? Podcasting's another. Yeah. Yeah. Who who doesn't want to like harness the power of turning talents, hobbies, side gigs into like actual viable business, whether it be a side hustle that brings in a little bit of extra spending money or something that you do like you do. You basically, from what I understand, went from full-time nurse to basic working at home and all of these other things that you've listed that you've been doing. So it seems like a lot, but it also seems like you're making it work pretty well. I love so. it. You know, it, it sounds like a lot, but there was, there was something that was tolling on me when I, before I did this and it was working a lot. I was at the hospital a lot. It was consuming my life. I was on night shift. I also did like a lot of nurses I know had an extra PRN thing on the side. I was burnt out and now I'm not at all. I actually look forward to the clinical work. I love my patients again and I love what I do again. It's not that mm -hmm. I didn't love it, but you get to that point that you're so burnt out and it wasn't worth it. The honeymoon phase definitely wears off. Yes. And then sometimes you find yourself in a place where you create a space in which you can like fall in love with your, your role again. Yes. And I want to say this just briefly, that there's been a lot of talk about nurses and side hustles. And some people say like, you did all of this education and paid for all of this school. You didn't 
pay all of this money to do little side hustles because I have friends that do like dog walking, Uber driving, mm-hmm. um, writing, um, co- like I do tutoring on the side for nursing students. There are all these little things that people do. And some people say, eh, don't waste your time. Just pick up overtime, help out your unit. But it's like, you know what? There are so many factors that make it important for nurses or any healthcare workers to have these like non-stressful, enjoyable, like side gigs, basically. It takes a different part of your brain. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that while there's a lot of honor and um, a lot of people do, they pick up extra, they pick up overtime, they join committees, they get involved in their job. But for some people, for someone like you, there's so much that you can do. Why would you limit yourself to just being at the bedside and doing nothing else. Because as nurses, we know we're like multifaceted people, if you can believe that. And we have other talent. Yeah. And you know, when I had my second son is when I realized I couldn't keep going to work all the time and taking myself away from my kids all the time. And it was, I mean, it wasn't just the three twelves. I was that person picking up extra. I was the person on all the different committees. And like you said, it was, a. I don't know if it was a honeymoon phase or I just enjoyed it. I did. I loved it. I loved working and, and being there. But then the more you work, the more they like you work in, the more they <laughs> get in charge, the more responsibilities you get. And that's when it was getting to be tolling when you're training every single nurse that comes on the unit. And, you know, training can be exhausting. Yeah. Like yeah. Cross training right now. You're oh, teaching yeah. plus doing plus like kind of supervising. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's a lot, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. I think that, you know, I, I know a lot more nurses that are starting to say, like, I really love my job, but maybe I want to, like me, I like to podcast about it. This yes. is a way that I can, you know, be a part of my industry and my profession on a scale larger than, like, just the people that I work with on my unit or in my yep. hospital. Um, and so- I think it's something to be said about nursing can be taken away from those four hospital walls. Uh-huh. You can take nursing into so many different areas of life. Yeah. And so today, this area that we're going to talk about, which I'm really excited to dig into, is health writing. Health. So what, healthcare writing, health writing, tell me what the, what the correct term or terms are when we're talking about this? So what I call it, and this is what's tough, like registered nurse, if you search for a job, registered nurse, you're going to find registered nursing jobs. But when it comes to writing, it's not this like clear cut word. I call it a health content writer for the type of writing that I do. There's all different types of medical writing that nurses can get into. But the types I like to do is basically just health content writing, which has to do with mostly web articles, blog writing, and simple um, patient care stuff. But I also do course writing as well. And um, that's for, you know, companies like Relias and like Lippincott and all those, Mm -hmm. all the things you have to do at work, right? All those things you have to go through. (laughs) Someone writes them. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's just two examples, but there's other things like, um, pharmaceutical writing, you know, people write those brochures that go into all of our drug packets. People write protocols for um, research studies. That's a medical writer. So pretty much anything you're reading, some sort of content writer did it. So think about if you're, you know, if you just bought a brand new car, someone wrote that. It wasn't a nurse probably, but it was somebody who specializes in content writing for cars or whatever that is. So There's all different types of writing and to be a nurse and offer health content writing services puts you at a higher level than somebody who is just a writer. I don't want to say just a writer. Right, but someone who maybe doesn't have a strong medical background. That specialized knowledge, yeah. So Mm -hmm. when when people look to hire writers and they see that you are a nurse, they, they want you. And it doesn't even really matter sometimes how elite your writing skills are. 
Yeah, because as nurses, we are not only educators of our patients and their families, but then like you were saying, you're training, you're educating other professionals, um, you know, you're educating potentially other um, support services that you're working with. And so I think that it's really interesting to hear you talk about all these different like applications. It's true. Everything mm-hmm. from like what's written, you know, in your insert that comes with your medication to like, I always think about like pamphlets, brochures, yes, um, instructional diagrams, like all of those types of things. And then myself, I dabble. I'm not that great at it and I'm not very consistent, but I do love um, blog writing. Yes. I love, um, I love having the style of a particular author, but I also like information that's very like skimmable yep. and actionable and links me to other things that are going to like, usually if I find a podcast or some kind of writing that I'm into, I will click other links on that, that author's website or that particular site because I like the way it's presented. So yeah. And that's web writing. Yeah. And so um, that's something that I know I'm into. I know I've had other nurses that I've talked to that are into that. I know there are bloggers listening right now, whether they be professional bloggers or like aspiring students. Um, And I think that this is really interesting. I would love to know more about where this like idea first sprouted. Like, okay, so there's a point at which you are not a health content writer. You are not doing this as a job. At what point are you like, this is awesome. I could totally do this. I think it gets, I just had a- You said like after your your second son was born, right? Yeah. Yeah. For me, that's definitely when it was. For other people, it's that burnout factor. For other people, it's they're streaming into retirement and that they want to take an easier route to the end, not working 12-hour shifts. Some people, it's they are working um, part-time at work and they just need some extra income on the side. So they're doing it, you know, for that. And other people are are just doing it like they just want to do like one article a month and they know they can make just, you know, an extra, extra money to go do whatever they, you know, whatever they want to do, the hair, their nails, whatever that might be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the beauty of it is that it does give you a little bit of extra freedom. And because I feel like if it's something that's your hobby, it doesn't feel like you broke your back to work for. Yes. Even though but that being can be- said, if it if it is something you want to make lucrative, keeping it a hobby will restrict you from doing that. True, true. Um, so really you need to kind of, and I don't know, I think that are there some people that kind of start doing this as a hobby and then yep. they go, hey, wait a minute, this is actually something that I can harness to... It's a total mindset thing, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. People are like, oh, I, you know, I just do some writing. I just do write. I That's write. Right? <laughs> yeah, I do that sometimes. But once you actually say, like, I am a writer and I'm a nurse and I produce content for so-and-so companies, when you start to get, you know, your portfolio established and stuff, it's this total shift where now you're pitching clients as more of a writer, but you're also a nurse rather than a nurse who wants to be a writer. Mm hmm. Yeah. Interesting distinction there. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is very applicable for nurses at, like you said, all stages of career, new nurses, young moms, um, retiring nurses. Um, So I guess even though there's like a million different ways that this could probably occur, different companies, different ways you can get paid, different types of writing. Can you kind of like, I don't know, how do I want to say this? I have this general curiosity of like how you would walk yourself through, I don't even know what the right term is, a gig, you know, how you get started. I mean, do you start your own blog and then approach companies? Do you have... The number one question I get from writers is, so how do I get started? Yeah. And that is my number one question. And that is also the hardest question I have for an answer because... I don't know exactly what they've done in the past. And some people are like, yeah, I, and I don't know what their intentions are either. So actually on my website, I, my like little opt-in for people is two sheets. One of them's three questions to ask yourself to know if a career as a, as a nurse writer is right for you. You know, first to just even explore, like, do, do I think I want to do this? Cause it sounds like it sounds like something I want to do, but you know, we dive into like that sheet itself. We'll talk to you about like, cool. when will you do it? Right. So you have to kind of map it out. And then in there, I also have like five 
podcast episodes related to when will you do this pod, this side hustle. So it talks about like, when should you plan your week? How to implement a tool, I guess is what I call it, into my time management called batching. Mm-hmm. How everybody has like 168 hours in a week and how to use them. <laughs> these are all, these are actually all titles of blogs that I wrote down that I wanted to mention yes. that, and I, then, that I liked. Yeah. Five ways to prepare yourself as a health writer, accountability, how to get yourself accountable for your work or for this business that no one's keeping you accountable for except yourself. Um, and then I dive into there, like, why do you want to start a business? It's mm-hmm. also people say, oh, how do I start? But I don't know. Why do you want to start it? And I just downloaded so, that one. <laughs> it's a mindset also, thing again. This is great. I also just listened to the one about how to write faster. Yes. Um, yeah, because I, I especially now that we're all kind of home on, you know, self-isolation and it's really easy to get distracted if you're not used to working at home. Oh, yeah. And everybody else that lives with you is home too. So I think that I, I immediately was like, oh my God, I have to listen to I need, I need something, yes. <laughs> I, need something to help so me I think there's so much great information. So I'll make sure to link to that because I think that is what a lot of people want to know. Like, yeah, I love to write. I write yeah. all the time. I the do. other part is who do you want to write for? And that helps yeah. you figure out like who, what type of writing do you even want to do? And then in there, that second page is just five steps to quickly kickstart your writing business. So just getting, diving into that. Just like stop talking about it and do it. Do it. Yeah. And that's, the, that's the, how do I start? You just start. You just do it. <laughs> you just do so, Take one little step and, and make it happen. So are there exercises or things that you, like, I know some people, like, they wake up every morning and they just free write for, like, mm-hmm. a f- couple pages or what a, a length of time. Or there are some people that I know, I know moms that, like, when they, um, when they try to do any kind of journaling or writing or video making, they do it when their kids are napping or at grandma's yep. or whatever. Um, and I know that I like to take little stupid notes that I put on my iPhone of like something that annoyed me. Well, now I'm going to write a blog post about what I'm going to do about it to make it better. I know everybody kind of comes across inspiration in different ways. What are some things that you do that keep your like creative juices flowing or like get you in the spirit of writing or, or even just motivate you to like do it every day like you're supposed to? Sure, sure. I think I get like bursts of the creative energy. Like, because if I, I don't know why, sometimes I just feel like my task list is so much that I can't freely think every single day. I take creative time in my own head to like read a book or something like that, like listen to a podcast. That's kind of like my creative time because sometimes I get inspiration from books I'm reading or podcasts I'm listening to. But as for like my own content, it really thrives off my readers and my people in our group. Like I start, I I just go off questions people have because that's always what people want is what you, you know, want to deliver is answers to their questions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it stems from there. And then, you know, you said like people do this, like when their kids are napping, when, you know, first thing in the morning, I have been through all those seasons of life and, (laughs) you know, it's my, my baby used to nap and I would, you know, have time to write then. And then as he went to preschool, I, I coined that term, the hour of power. And that's when I would do my task list during that hour of power. And the way I would make it work is that, you know, sometimes we only get these little chunks of time to actually get stuff done. And I see so many people say, okay, I have an hour to get it done. And now the first 15, 20 minutes, they're figuring out what they need to get done instead of already having that plan ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Like at nighttime, I usually make like a to-do list for the next day. And when I wake up in the morning, it's not my free time to do whatever. I usually get started on my list because I know my kids are waking up and then I have other things to do during the day because that's also when my energy is the highest. So I can really like get to work. Whereas time in the afternoon, my brain kind of slows down. And that's when I, you know, like to creatively think or just write or read or or listen or whatever I want to do. And so I think you also have to figure out what part of your day is your most 
energetic to be able to implement a lot of this stuff. Oh, as a long-term night shifter, I know that my prime hours are between like 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. So I, <laughs> you'll see if you look at pretty much any of my blog posts, they're all published like usually in those hours or like they're set to publish at like five in the morning because I finished it at like two in the morning. It's so funny because I, <laughs> I told my husband like I've now been on day shift since my son was like a year old. So about seven years. But before that, I did 10 plus years of night shift. And even now, if I stay up past like 11, I'm like, boom, I could stay up all night. You're up all I could stay up all night. Yeah, your <laughs> brain just it picks got awful that. in the morning because then everyone yeah. else wakes up. <laughs> but man, if I haven't had some great ideas when I'm all alone in the middle of the night, like watching oh, yes. Seinfeld reruns or something, and I'm like, this would make a great episode. Um, you know, the other thing is you also have to figure out what you are, like, as in, like, are you an introvert or an extrovert and how you kind of recharge in that manner. And I think a lot of creative ideas come to me because I'm introverted to a point. Like I get extroverted once you get to know me, but overall I'm pretty introverted and I kind of recharge myself by going out in nature, taking a walk by myself or just, just thinking like on my own, no one has, no one can be around me or whatever that is. And that's when all my creative time, like kind of happens like when I am alone with my thoughts. I've heard a lot of people say they have their best ideas in the shower or when they're oh, running yeah. or when You know why? Because like, there's nothing else. Yeah, because that's all you can do. And actually yeah. it's so <laughs> funny. So this is a true story. When I was in nursing school and I had like chapters upon chapters of like physiology or something really boring. Well, not all of it's boring, but if I had something I needed to read at length, I oftentimes would read it in the bathtub. I had like a little table, like one of those little trays you can stretch over the top because literally it was the only thing that I could do that would keep me from, I wouldn't move or do anything else because you're in the bathtub. And you, yeah. Yeah. And like once in a while you flip a page and then, you know, so those were, it sounds silly, but those were the ways that I actually was able to read that stuff when I was just like, oh, I don't want to do this. You'll find Sounds, anything to do. Sounds crazy. <laughs> I've seen memes of students that like put their notes in sheet protectors with the opening on the bottom side. And then they just, you know, they tape it shut and then they tape them all over the shower so they can study in the shower. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's, but, but it's like, but it's true. There's true, something yeah. to that, that your brain is doing nothing else. Well, especially in this distraction filled world. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You can't take your phone with you. You can't read Facebook while you're jogging. You can't right. like, yeah. So that's great. I think that's great. A lot of people have said that there's, there's money in that advice there, I think. So then what's your follow through? Like, like, so now we've talked about like the, the creative stuff, the stuff that gets you energized and pumped. But like, I know some people use different techniques. Like some people use the Pomodoro technique. Some mm-hmm. people will lock themselves in a room all day and not come out until it's done. Some people are very like right when the mood strikes. Um, how do you actually follow through? Like, how do you actually get these things written in, in the time that you need to or that you want to, the deadlines you've set for yourself? Sure. I do that batching technique a lot with with podcasting, for example, my podcast, I always do episodes on Thursdays. And yeah, I get like a lot of people's schedules in mind. Sometimes it doesn't work out for Thursdays, but that's usually what I try to do. So I, all my podcasting is on Thursday, whether that is recording episodes or planning episodes or outlining episodes or editing, it's all podcasts that day. And then with um, my other schedule, like Tuesdays are usually pretty rough days for me, meaning I usually work my weekend shift and I tack on a Monday. So I do the trifecta. So I usually do like the three twelves in a row. Then I come home Tuesdays or, you know, I wake up Tuesday morning and the house is destroyed and we need groceries. It's and recovery mode. Life, yeah. right? And uh-huh. yeah. laundry, all of that. So Tuesdays are my rough days. So I do not make like that a really tough mental work day <laughs> for me. No in the, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do the email check-ins and then I'm like Wednesday and I already know, I know my three twelves are coming. So I know that Tuesday is not going to be a tough day. So I usually, you know, tell clients that I don't push deadlines on Tuesdays. I don't push deadlines on Mondays. My deadlines are always like towards the end of the week, whatever that might be. And clients, here's the thing. There's no emergency in writing. No one's going to die. So they aren't (laughs) too pressed if you're like, I see you gave me the deadline of, you know, four, two. I don't know what day that was, but you know, that was a Monday. I would 
push that off until the end of the week. And they're usually like, oh, that's fine. And you tell them, I'm a nurse and I still work at the hospital. They go, okay, I get it. Yeah, they go, yeah. <laughs> so, I know you know, that they're means. very <laughs> accommodating to that type of work. So, so yeah, that, definitely with that, that's how I kind of planned that. But to actually follow through on things, the Pomodoro is definitely something I do religiously. Another thing I do is Benario beats. And I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. You, you just go to like YouTube, you know, you can yes. do whatever and put in Benario beats for focus or for uh-huh. sleep or whatever that might, whatever you want to do. Oh girl, I'm so deep on. in that world. I oh my God. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> And it works. I'm telling and, you. And I do actually right before um, we started talking, I was working on some notes for some other projects sitting here at my desk. And one of the things that helps me focus, this sounds weird, but um, there's this thing called sand cutting, which is exactly what it sounds like. They have like that kinetic sand, like play sand. Do you uh-huh. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And oh, they yeah. literally just take like different knives and cookie cutters and stuff like that. And they hook an, a mic up, a sensitive mic. And they literally just like cut and it's just like, and something about that triggers something in my brain that makes me hyper-focused. And it's I don't- interesting, isn't it? I've yeah. heard of that. And it's like that, there's sand cutting, there's something else too that I've heard or seen. And I'm like, why is this so relaxed? Oh, it's like a visual one. I think it's like some watching somebody squish sand or oh yeah yeah all of whatever that it stuff, is yeah and it is it like calms mm-hmm. you down you're like what is so this is so weird yeah <laughs> and I've used those techniques for being in school and working on podcast stuff and even mm-hmm. just if I just need to just calm myself down and not be trying to because usually I'm listening to podcasts and you're absorbing information and sometimes it's just too much so I also listen to like lo-fi hip hop and all these different like um like meditative music yeah people say that like m- um music at a certain like hurt level I don't know what the appropriate term is but like certain hurts like actually promote concentration and that's have been Ario bean stuff yeah, yeah that's exactly it okay so I do know what you're talking about yes and I put it on all the time, like when I'm working and it almost, if you're not, if you're trying to like listen to it and actually like listen to it and not do work, I can see why people say like, how are you not falling asleep? Because it is just like this, this music, but it's, it doesn't put me to sleep at all. It makes me focus. Well, but. it's ri- it's rhythmic. It's, you know, there's no lyrics, so you don't yes. have to be distracted yes. by sing- distracted by singing along to your favorite song. Yep. And I've also heard people say, I can't remember who I was, t- I think I talked about this in um episode I did with my massage therapist where we talked about like if something is like rhythmic, we can ignore it and like our brain can tune it out. But if that thing becomes a rhythmic, then yes. we can't tune it out. And that's when things become irritating to us, like fingers drumming or like, you know, a, a faucet dripping. Those are the things that like bug us because our brain can't ignore them. Interesting. So, yes. yeah. yeah. So I don't, I might be getting the science of that wrong. Like, don't come after me, but like, that's, <laughs> So yes, yeah, so I think this is great advice and I encourage students to even try this. Yes, like, for sure. Even if you're not like yet to your professional self, um, as a student, this is a great idea as well. So I got really excited about that. Sorry. I kind of No, I do you know. too. It's like I tell everybody about it. That's really great. Um and I think everybody can find something. There's such a variety of that sort of thing. So yeah, I think that writing for me is definitely encouraged by that kind of like some people just like white noise, just like a fan yeah. in the background or classical music. Um but yeah, it, that also lights up a different part of your brain. It sure does. It sure does. So then you've got these great techniques and this, this like schedule and you're batching and you're like putting things out on a regular basis with any kind of online, anything, podcasts, blogs, vlogs, people like regularity. They like knowing when to expect you and they like when you show up and they don't like listening to, to episodes where they say, sorry, I've been gone for so long every <laughs> single time you podcast. So there is something to like having these techniques that help you keep a schedule, especially as everyone knows when you're either self-studying or your own boss, those deadlines, like they want those deadlines. They don't care that you watch Netflix for six hours yesterday. So, (laughs) so it's cool that you have this like structure of like, 
Thursday is my podcast day. Tuesday is my catch up on life day. Yes. Um, So then how do you, in all of that, that swirl of activity that's happening, how do you then work the business aspect into it? I imagine that there are probably a lot of people that come to you and then you also seek out jobs, gigs, writing, articles, whatever. So talk a little bit, uh, please, about kind of the general business side of things, because you did talk a little bit about that earlier. Sure. I have... um... I do every once in a while. I don't have one currently, but sometimes I hire on some help. Like I use a VA for some of that admin kind of stuff. Tuesdays, again, is also like my day my podcast goes live. So I always um, do my admin kind of stuff that day because it's not as tolling on my brain. So I make a point during the day at my low energy times to do the admin stuff. I don't do the heavy thinking stuff in the end of my day or afternoon of my day. The other thing I do is make sure my email isn't consuming me, make sure Facebook isn't consuming me. And I'll tell you, you get a whole heck of a lot of stuff done. I also do like with pitching clients or whatever, I do a lot of my research and behind the scenes kind of stuff with that. And then I pitch everybody a a lot on the same day because I feel like there's something to be said for like a templated email that you can personalize. So there is a lot of that in my pitching and it makes a lot easier to reach out instead of doing from scratch every single time Mm -hmm. for each client. So that's kind of like a little bit of what I do. That's absolutely great. I've done a little bit of that, um, but I'm still so early in the game for myself that I haven't quite like, I don't feel like I've hit that stride yet of like, okay, I like how this is worded. I have this system down yeah. and I'm still struggling with the batching. I'm trying to be a better batcher because I think that people in lots of creative industries talk about the benefits of batching. So there's yeah. something to it. It's not just hype. Like there really is some, some good, um, strategy there. Um, try it. Try it with just one thing. Try it with just your podcast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Instead and that's just it. I get, things. I get so like, I, even though I have ideas and goals and I do, I get kind of scattered. I'm like, Oh wait, yeah. this would make a great episode. Oh, but wait, yeah, could it also, <laughs> um, but to that effect, I really like the episode that you did on, uh, what's it called? Like repurpose one blog, like five mm-hmm, different ways. Five different times. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that I was like, Oh, bookmark. This is great yeah. information to come back to. So, um, I, I'm just going to send like put a link to your podcast and your website in Instead the description episode but, but that's what's so great but that's what's so great about podcasts is that you can either listen to them every single one front to back or you can listen to them like reference when they become relevant yes because some of the podcasts like when I first found your show some of the episodes weren't really that relevant to me yep but now that time has gone by I'm like oh wait I totally want to go back and listen like I went back and listened to the episode that you did on Canva which Canva, mm-hmm. I now use the app. It's both online and on the phone. I use Canva like constantly now. Yep. And so for those of you that don't know, Canva is great, whether you are making graphics for your website, um, media kits, uh Really, any anything graphic with letters anything, and colors yeah. and photos and pretty stuff, flyers, bake sale notices, anything you want. So stuff like and that. And it's free. Unless you and want it's free, right? You know, all your branding in there, right? So you can kind of use this information as like reference. I love it when I find a podcast or a blog or a website or something that has multiple things that I'm interested in. Because yes. even though I might not binge listen, sometimes I do. Lots of times I do. I'm like, I have to listen to every single episode, <laughs> but most of the time I'm like, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll download this or I'll save it. I'll listen to it when I'm like running errands. I keep saying like running errands or, you know, visiting. I haven't done any of that in like a month. I know. um, And I, (laughs) I've noticed my podcast listening is down because I'm not doing all that. used to like binge audio books and a lot of the podcasting. I feel like now that we're quarantined, I don't get to do that as much because I'm not alone. That's why. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) No one one leaves me alone. (laughs) So now instead of everybody doing all this stuff, everybody's on TikTok doing ridiculous Oh, I know. (laughs) They are hilarious. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They are. Um, So yeah, so it's, we've, we've got a lot, we've talked about a lot of stuff already. We're kind of talking about how people can start their own journey and some of the rewards that that 
that can bring. Like you can absolutely have a business bloom out of it. You can have a hobby. You can have something that is like your side gig. There's so many different options here. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the resources that you offer for people. Everything. Let's start with the um, let's let's start with the paid services first, and then move our way into the stuff that's available for everybody, like sure. the podcast and some other things. So, first, will you please talk about? You've mentioned your courses and your one-on-one coaching. I would love to know more about those as well. So, the one-on-one course or one-on-one coaching that is. I use a app called Boxer and it is pretty cool. And I don't recommend it just for just coaching. You can use it just to have an accountability partner. If there's another nurse writer out there, then you guys want to talk back and forth, but maybe you're on two different time zones or maybe she's a night owl and you're not. Voxer's cool because they're voice texts, basically, or voice notes that get saved. So it's like a walkie-talkie back and forth and you can always go back on it, which is cool. And it's free and, and all the things. But the point of coaching with it is the same thing. People can leave me messages. And with my coaching package, I don't just stick you on a call for an hour and that is all you get. We do like an eight hour day. So if you were to Voxer me at 9am and I get it at 930 and then I give you some resources and I give you a talk through or whatever, and then you you implement or you write those things down and you're like, oh, but I have another question. But you know, your kid is bugging you and now it's 1015. So you could then tell me your question then or whatever that might be. So yeah, it's just a, that's cool. a day with me. It goes like back and forth. It's it's fun. Um, it's like but, having your bestie just like a voicemail. Yeah. Room, <laughs> and it's cool because, you know, you get a lot out of it. But if you're really, really just starting out, I don't recommend that one. There is a larger course and this this one I am adding to constantly. There's like 39 lessons now. And I think yesterday I wrote down like 20 more than I want to add to it. <laughs> nice. And it's cool because it's, you get CEUs for it. You get 2.1 CEUs and it's called plan, create, launch, land, and grow your health writing business. And it's for the people that are just starting out. They maybe wrote one or two pieces. They kind of know the internet. They maybe know a little bit about Google Doc and they want to just start growing their business. And that I look at it as like the roadmap to starting your business. So that's why I'm like, there's like 20 more lessons I want to put in here because I just don't think it's good enough roadmap yet. And what's cool is you pay the one price and it never goes up and it's just a lifetime membership to it. Like you don't have to ever pay for it again. The other one I have is health freelance writing 101. And it's just eight lessons and it's super simple. And it literally is the basics. Like what is a freelance writer? Why should I do it? How do I start? Kind of very, very basic. And then I have a free one that is called the nursing process behind booking writing clients. It's like the done for you care plan for prospects for oh, writing nice. clients. And that one's just free because I figured I was going to throw it into the big course which I'm going to anyway, just to have it in there for everybody. But I just thought, you know what, I'm going to let this one be open for those that are just maybe not ready for the big course, but just want to gain more clients. And I walk through that one with just like how I do it. And I just screen share and, and just walk you right through it. So nice. Yeah, that's so. great. Those are amazing resources. And then and then that downloadable that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's a free thing too. I'm all about it. And my and my collective group. I was over just going to say, yeah. and that's not <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> so over on Facebook, the Savvy Scribe Collective is the group of writers. So it's just everybody in there. I usually go live once a week and just present something valuable. Sometimes it's twice a week. Sometimes I do more typing than video or whatever it is. I just kind of go with it. And whatever the questions. week needs. Yeah. yeah, whatever the week needs. It's <laughs> my group. I do whatever I want. <laughs> yeah. And then people get to like share their ideas. Yes. And... Their wins and their yeah. struggles. And yeah, every, everybody's loving it in there. And, you know, I know personally that there aren't like a million people in my inner circle that are like trying to be health writers. So sometimes you feel like maybe you don't have that community behind you and now you can have it. Yeah. Find your people. Find your people. (laughs) 
Yeah. And that's really cool because then you end up, and that's really cool because then you end up meeting people that um, you never know when that person is going to become a source of like another job or yep. great ideas. Referrals. Or, yep. Exactly. So I think this is great. And actually I um, have quite a lot of things that now I want to do for myself. <laughs> I'm going to immediately start writing. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of juicy stuff that we've talked about that are... Mm -hmm. Um, that my listeners can actually like take some of the stuff and run. And because they're home and they're not driving to work, they're actually able to like take some notes and follow through on these things. Um, yes. This is fantastic. I would love to, to, again, just kind of reiterate quickly your website and how people can contact you if they want to hire you or co get coaching or whatever. So sure. Please. Sure. The Savvy Scribe Podcast .com is my website, um, the Savvy Scribe Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And then LinkedIn is where I love to spend a lot of my professional time, I should Ooh, say. So. Can we talk about LinkedIn for a second? Oh my gosh. I love LinkedIn. Yes. I am. I'm just starting like on a scale of one to 10, one being like never logged in, never heard it. And 10, I'm like, I was at like a two and I am steadily moving my way into like the four and fives. How, help me get into the six, seven, eight of yeah, like, so, utilizing LinkedIn. So I knew most of my clients were going to be found on LinkedIn. I didn't know this from the start, obviously, but I figured this out. And so then all of a sudden in my head, I'm like, that's where nurses are. Everybody's on LinkedIn. And then I realized nobody's on LinkedIn. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> in nursing is on Facebook and or Twitter or Instagram is where I'm usually finding nurses. But LinkedIn is truly the place for writing clients. So if you are interested in health writing, you should definitely have a LinkedIn profile. And on your LinkedIn profile, what's so cool is you can use it as a blog. So you start writing on there. They have their, it's right when you do like a status update, like you would on Facebook, you do write an article and you actually have a piece on LinkedIn that you can actually use for a portfolio for yourself. Oh, nice. And what that does is make you that content like expert. So if I really, really wanted to be known as a OB health writer person, because that's what I work in as OB, I would write a lot of articles relating to obstetrics or maybe what COVID-19 is doing with obstetrics and, and really write my thoughts and research it and all that so that when clients come upon it or I pitch somebody through LinkedIn, and you'll see if you do that nursing process for booking a writing client course, that free one I have, I show you exactly how to find clients right on LinkedIn to pitch because a lot of us are like, you're on a website and it says to email info at so-and-so.com and you're like, I don't know who this is going to. But truly on LinkedIn is where you can actually find the editor and the content manager and the people to actually pitch so that you're not constantly in this, like, who do I make sure, you know, it probably just is getting deleted if you, mm -hmm. you know, in your whole wasted time pitching. But yeah, it's, it's really a great platform. And I have Louise Brogan is the person I love to follow. She's from um, Ireland, I think, and, or England, one of those. And she is awesome on LinkedIn and she has her own po podcast as well. Um, let me look it up really quick because she's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I recently beefed up my LinkedIn profile and I'm glad I did. I spent a little time on it because the last time I, I haven't applied for any jobs, but I just like to be curious and look. And there were a few websites that gave me the option to link my LinkedIn profile instead of submitting a resume. Yeah. I That's think another thing, a lot, is she's from, she's from Ireland. I was right. Um, the other thing with that, I think a lot of nurses are like, what do I do? Put on my, my writing profile on LinkedIn that I'm a nurse or that I'm a writer. Well, if you put that you're a, just a nurse, you are going to get every single person that wants you to start travel nursing or recruiting. Uh -huh. This is true. Person. And if you put that you're a writer, people are like, but I don't know if I want to put that because what if my boss sees it and what if my coworkers see it and they think I'm going to quit because now I'm a writer. And I always tell everybody, nobody's looking. <laughs> so 
<laughs> Nobody cares. You're the only one who cares. And if you just put on your your LinkedIn, you don't have to add your boss. You don't have to add your coworkers. If like, you don't and want you can to. put like profile. And you can put hula hoop aficionado for all. Like, yes, who cares? yes. You can be no one cares. You want. <laughs> Yeah. So Louisa's podcast for LinkedIn is social B, like the insect, and I. So if you listen to her podcast, um, she ha- every episode is about LinkedIn. So here's like, there was one she did in January, the weird and wonderful hacks other people use on LinkedIn. So it's definitely a way to grow yourself. She has a LinkedIn challenge too, to start connecting with your first like 500 people. So it's, it's fun. It just gets delivered to your email and you just start going out and doing it. So I'm jotting that down because um, that sounds, that sounds great. Also, um, hello, Irish lady and on a podcast. Of course I want to listen to that. She's so so fun to listen to. (laughs) Absolutely. That's really cool. Wow. Oh my gosh. I immediately, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to go and like look up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> this is do you all listen, great information. Do you listen to the Biz Chicks podcast? No, not yet. Oh, oh yeah, do that one too. Okay. <laughs> it's chicks with an X. Okay. Okay. So Biz Chicks. They're, they have both, like hers and Natalie, which is Biz Chicks and Louise's, they're very inspirational. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, there goes my free time. Today. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is excellent. Uh, so as we, as we kind of wrap this up, is there anything else that's like any other topics or ideas or things that you want to share with the audience that we haven't covered that you think might be like good for hmm. them to, to hear. I'm putting you on the spot here. I always put people on the spot. Right, right. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's something, if you have the creative mindset, if you are a person who likes to write, check it out. Just just kind of dabble in it and see if this is something you would like to do. I encourage you, if you are starting to feel burnout at your job and you are ready for a little bit of a change, don't just think that it's an easy way to earn money. It's not, but it's a heck of a lot easier than being in charge of everybody's life every single day. And here's a little side note, and it's not all about the money, but you do make more money writing, which is so sad for me to even admit than you do in nursing. Yeah. The harsh uh, reality right there. Yeah, but, you know, th- there's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't here's, even it. Here's the thing. Yeah. Make make a goal. If you are interested in doing this and you want a client, this is what I did. My first goal for myself was to make as much as I make an hour as a nurse, because that's all we know, right? We're, we're hourly workers. Mm-hmm. So like everybody's like, oh, like what's your salary? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Times my hours. <laughs> look at my, <laughs> look at my W9 yeah. and, and all that stuff. But um, that's, that's the goal I tell people because Clients are going to ask you what your rates are and you're not going to know because you don't know how long things take you, first off. And when you start to break it down into hourly, when you write your first article, I want you to try to time yourself, not to race the clock, but to see how long the entire process, not just writing, but the research, the outline, the writing, and the editing actually take you because that will give you like an hourly rate. And I'm not even joking here that on the small end nurse writers that are writing health content are making no less than 75 an hour. So wow. it's, I can't believe I almost didn't even think to ask that. Like shame on me as a host. No, and I, yeah, that's an important money is always, well, money is always like a secret, you know, and you're not going to be rich as a nurse. We know that. Right. And I'm not rich as a writer, but I sure of a heck a lot. I really enjoy making money, more money than I in my pajamas than I do on the floor caring for lives sometimes, especially when I hear the drama at work. We know, you know, you hear everybody's drama all the time. I don't want to be part of that. So if I don't have to be, I would rather be at home with my kids and doing this on the side and then do my hours at work and call it a day. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a lot of freedom in that because then you know that you're at your floor job because you want to be and not because you're desperate to make ends meet. Um, And I find that while some people are in that situation, 
I just think people are better suited to do what they do when they're not, like we've talked about, when they're not burned out, when they're not Absolutely. totally ripped apart and burnt at both ends. Um, I think that it, it does wonders for us. But yeah, and that's I don't like to come across as like the person that say, leave bedside. No, we need nurses. At no, the it's like, do, <laughs> yeah, but you can do both. And um, it's just a matter of finding that balance because, Absolutely. you know, even though we all need those days of recovery and like R and R on the couch, there are also absolutely people that are like, I don't really have a hobby. And it's like, well, here you go. You love yep. your hobby. We have lots of ideas. Um, and so this is great. And it's true. We don't really talk about money much. It kind of becomes this like, you don't talk about your underwear. You don't talk about your salary. You don't talk about your religion. Like there's so many societal, like cultural boundaries we've put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is important to know because as a podcaster, the first time someone offered me sponsorship, I had no idea. I was afraid I was going to lowball myself and make myself cheaper, which not only does that like hurt you, but then it's like, oh, well now you're bringing down the rates for everybody. Exactly. Don't be the underdog. (laughs) Don't be be the super cheap one that's like screwing it up for the professionals that are trying to be you know, in that competitive niche. But also it's true, like, because people don't talk about it, you don't know how to hit that sweet spot of like not underselling yourself, but also like, I don't want to ask for a rate and then have them be like, thanks. Thanks for responding. We're not interested. Good luck to you. Um, So yeah, I think that that's a, that's a great starting point. Think about how much time you're actually investing in this. It's hard for me personally to do that because I don't have that batching system yet. And I'm just kind of working Mm -hmm. on it all over the place, like five minutes here, 20 minutes here. And so I don't really have a great idea of how long these things take. I think that's well, you know, it doesn't take that. 12 hours to right. do an article. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think that's a good starting point for people. Here's another question. Do you find that negotiation occurs or is it like you tell them what you are interested in achieving or making and then they either say yay or nay or are there like negotiations that occur? So there's a, everybody tries to to lowball you at first. Um, it's just, I think what they tell them to do, like the content managers, oh, just offer her this. And I will go back and offer higher. And then they'll come back and say, well, I really can't afford that. And then they kind of leave it open a little bit. And then I come back and still shoot a little higher, but still where I want to be. The other way to do it is I listen, this is the best way to do it, is get them on the phone, really listen to what they need, their pain points, draw them up a proposal with like three levels so that you can kind of work with whatever budget they have. And then they aren't like pressuring you to take something that you may not feel comfortable with. Sure. Yeah, that's great advice. That's super good advice. Yeah, those uncomfortable negotiations don't have to be uncomfortable. They can just be collaborative, I would hope. Yeah, it's just a conversation, truly. But it's true. We Many of us have such weird hang-ups about money. Oh, yeah. Um, and it shouldn't be. It, I mean, there there's a, a time and a place for privacy, but really, like, it's the same. But there is, it is a huge thing for, for nurses who are becoming writers because we're not confident in our writing abilities oh, yeah. yet. <laughs> so you're totally going to lowball yourself. Totally. Like uh, when you're for going towards your first client, you're going to lowball yourself. So if you have questions about like before you quote a project for, for a client or before you get on the phone with them, that's why the group is there. Post it in there and people will be like, whoa, no way, go higher. Or holy cow, no, lower. (laughs) Nice. So basically all of the questions that we've left, kind of anything that I've not asked or that we've left open-ended, just go to the collective. Absolutely. We'll talk about it there. And I'm in there all the time. So if if you're not getting a response, I'll respond. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to actually, like I said, I signed up for the email list. I've already been following the podcast. And so now I need, oh, also your Pinterest. I got to promote that too. I'm a (laughs) Pinterest freak. I love Pinterest. And you have a great Pinterest board as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, my friend Vicki, she, she's a nurse writer too. She taught me Pinterest. I didn't realize how valuable it was and until I got on there, but you know, 
listeners, just don't overwhelm yourself with so many platforms, but it is somewhere. But there's something like for everybody. Every, there is. That's their there favorite. Is. And the cool thing with, with writing, once you get into the writing, you don't want to burn yourself out with writing, right? You want to be like, okay, now what? But if you do writing, you're going to learn these different platforms and then you can help clients upsell them on different platforms that they might need help with. So yeah. for, ex- like, for example, I could do like Pinterest for a client if I wanted to. So, you know, there's always, there's always ways to around things. Yeah. It's just, um, you just got to find the the spot that you like the best because there, there are so many choices out there. I feel like I lean towards like microblogging on Instagram and then also like the website. And, you know, I always feel like I'm such like this, uh, consistent blogger these days. And I went and I looked the other day and I haven't put up a blog post since January. So I was (laughs) Come on. Maybe not. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you, it, it, a little advice for people out there. If you're going to start a blog, do not do one post and then launch no, it. No, get, get it. Really, get really several. get it. Like, yeah, yeah it, like at least eight, I would say. Yeah, because if someone <laughs> but, comes to your website or your blog or your LinkedIn or whatever and they see you have one post. Yes. Like, it, but they're probably not going to subscribe. Whereas if they come to your page and they see that you have like 10 things that they want to read, they're going to come back. Yep. Mark you. They're going to, you know, follow you or whatever. So great, great insight there. Um, yeah. Oh, so much good information. <laughs> Thank I'm so you. glad that we got to talk. Me too. And, Me too. Um, I know <laughs> there's so much more that people can check out. So yeah, check out the Savvy Scribe Podcast.com. Did I get it right? Is that the Savvy Scribe Podcast.com? Yep. Perfect. So and then from there people can find all of the other great things that you do and the content that you create. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today. This has been really fun. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I've already got a little to do list as I've been sitting here, I've been jotting down things. So <laughs> I'm going to go subscribe to some new podcasts and bookmark some things. And I'm going to, I also, I'm kind of like, I got to go look at my LinkedIn again. because I want to make sure my LinkedIn looks good because now everybody's <laughs> going to be like, Hey, I should go look at Adrienne's LinkedIn. She's totally talking it up. So I better make sure it's not a train wreck. <laughs> but right. you know what? If it is, that's why people like you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The weird, the weird, real, right? real stuff. That's totally true. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Janine. And um, everybody else, I want you to, oh, and Janine, you can check this out too. Go to the Nursing Uncensored website at nursinguncensored.com. See that blog post that I put up back in January. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is I have several drafts. I just, I just need to do it. So um, with all of that, with everything we've talked about in mind, I just want to encourage people to, to check out all this stuff and um, start writing. Sit down right now. Write something. Yep. All right. Awesome. Thanks again, Janine. Happy Thank nursing. You. Here at Nursing Uncensored, we may be, well, uncensored, but we're not unfiltered. Protected health information has been changed and concealed to comply with HIPAA. The things we talk about are from years of experience with thousands of patients, things we've read, stories we've heard. If you think we're talking about you, we're definitely not. Also, we're real nurses here to provide helpful and accurate information, but don't take anything we say as fact without doing your own research. Refer to your state's Board of Nursing, Practice Acts, and your institution's policies and procedures if you have questions about your practice. Lastly, our very strong opinions are ours alone and do not reflect those of our employers, educational, or professional institutions. Thanks for listening, and happy nursing, folks.